Well, good morning. I'm actually surprised they let me back up here, but I'm going to roll with it. So, Well, uh, today's going to be a lot about doubt. And I know there's a lot of things that we doubt in our lives, a lot of things. Um, for our freshmen, some of you maybe doubted that you were going to even get into college. Well, here you are. You made it. Thank you that you're here. Um, for me, uh, sometimes I doubt that I'm going to pass a test. Uh, I do that a lot, actually, a lot of papers. I doubt that I'm actually going to finish them on time. Um, we have a lot of doubts. I doubt that I'm going to make it to class. Actually, I did that this morning. I, I made it to class with one minute to spare, but I still made it. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of doubts in our lives. But today I want to focus on one very big one, a very big doubt that we have that none of us like to talk about. Because for some reason, in our Christian atmospheres, it's considered taboo. And of course, this is the doubt of God, something that you don't hear very often. Everyone doubts, but no one discusses it. I, I always wondered why. I wasn't born in a Christian home, and I said, how can you just believe that there's a guy in, in the sky that's watching over you at all times without at least for one second having some kind of reservation about that. Really, I, I just want to know, is there anybody here who has ever doubted God that he's going to provide, he's going to do anything, even maybe that he exists sometime? Is there anybody in here? Raise your hand. Oh, wow, almost everybody. Imagine that. Well, today we're going to be talking about why it's okay to feel that way. For some reason, our church likes to tell us that if you doubt God, if you doubt that he's going to provide for your life, if you doubt that he exists, even for a second, you are a sinner, and you should be ashamed of yourself. While it's not always healthy to always doubt God, I think it's natural, especially when we look around and we see all of us and how we act. So I'm going to be looking at John 20 today. And if you're not familiar with this chapter, it's basically the chapter when Jesus is getting resurrected. So he's been dead for three days. All this horrible stuff has happened. Everybody's in hiding, and no one knows what's going to happen. And there's these three disciples, and they all act in different ways on this day that Jesus is resurrected, the day that would change everything. But before I do that, I have to ask, why are we afraid to doubt? Are we afraid that, that it's weakness? I always feel that in our culture, weakness, weakness is doubt. And doubting is weakness. In our, in our culture, we're told that we have to have scientific proof. We have to have logical reasoning. Oh, and I've seen all, most of you people on Facebook, oh, you get in those fights really quickly. And so I see that, oh, they're bad. But we constantly fall back to this fact scenario. And so we've said that if we can't support what we say, if we don't know the truth about something, if we're really ignorant, we're weak. But I don't know about you, but I'm happy that I worship a God that works in my weakness. I'm sure you all know this, but I mean, 2 Corinthians, it's in 12.9. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. So then, now that I show you that doubting God and his power is, is sometimes normal, I'm going to go through these three people and kind of show you how we can relate to them. And so there's a doubt like Mary Magdalene, who we'll get into, a doubt like Peter, and a doubt like Thomas. So let's walk through what's going on in John 20 together. At this point in the story, as I said, Jesus it was gone. He'd been killed, crucified. No one knew what was going to happen. Now, let me remind you, he'd said many, many times, hey guys, I'm coming back. Don't worry. They didn't listen. I don't know why, but they didn't think he was coming back. So here we all are. The world is bleak. The Messiah is dead. The church, they don't know what they're doing. The thousands of followers that Jesus has, they think it was all a lie. 
People are starting to be persecuted in the streets. To even say Jesus' name is to be remarked as a fool and a drunkard. Imagine how you had to feel at this time. Alone, abandoned, and abused. And so you have this giant pressure on the disciples, the leader of this movement, who have been taking care of the church for this long, for three years they gave their lives. And now you have your Messiah gone. And so now I'm going to look at each of these people, and there's three things that I'm going to look at. In each of these scenarios, they always doubt it. And I want to know what caused it. And I want to see what the reaction is when they come in contact with Jesus in this doubt. And the last thing that we're going to look at with each of these people is Jesus' response. So let's take a look at Mary Magdalene and how she was reacting during the resurrection. So this is what the beginning of this chapter says in John 20. Early on, in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now imagine this. She runs to the tomb, and it's open. She doesn't go in the tomb. She runs away and goes to her friends. But can you blame her? Think about what would be waiting for her in that tomb. Either there's robbers in there, thieves, but at the very least, She's expecting to see the Messiah that she loved and worshipped dead, rotting away. Imagine what kind of pain that would cause her. It's got to be awful. I can't even imagine. So I, I want to see what caused her pain. I think what caused her pain and what caused her doubt was her pain. Because how can you trust God in this midst of being persecuted, attacked, called a fool, when you've been so hurt, when you've lost someone so close to you. I think that's something that a lot of us can deal with in this room. There's a lot of people in this room that have a lot of pain, like Mary Magdalene did. Maybe you've lost someone in your life, someone close to you, a mother, a father, a grandfather, grandmother, someone in your life that was so important to you, and I'm so sorry for that. Maybe your pain comes from something else, a broken relationship. Maybe it comes from a disease. I don't know what it was. But I want you to know my heart breaks for you. But even more so, I want you to know that Jesus' heart breaks for you. Let me show you her reaction. In verse 11, it says this. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Now let me tell you this. There's no reason that those angels needed to be there. Jesus was already gone. He had already resurrected. The only reason those angels were there was because Mary Magdalene had a broken heart. Her trust was gone. She doubted God because she had so much pain. There was no way that God could heal that pain in her heart. And this is Jesus' response. They asked her, Jesus and the angels, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she says, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, which, by the way, that's a really bad roast on Jesus' part. Like, the Messiah, no, you're just the gardener. Like, I'm we're not going to get there. Right. She said, Sir, if you have carried him away, 
Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned. And she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Like I said, there's no reason that Jesus needed to stay at that tomb. There's where, that was a place where he had suffered the most humility. He'd been killed, bleeding, and his corpse was tossed in a dark, bat-filled, gross place. But he stayed there, and he brought two angels with him just to help Mary Magdalene doubt. And so the reason I'm telling you this is because when you suffer and your doubt comes from the pain in your life, God will comfort you. It's a big thing that we need to know about God's character. I don't know what you're going through. I know sometimes it feels like you have a blindfold on that you can't see God, but he's there. Maybe sometimes you just think he's the gardener. He wants to help your broken heart. But it's okay to doubt him because look at it. Jesus didn't get mad at Mary Magdalene. He didn't rebuke her. He didn't even scream. He didn't, he didn't even give her the cold shoulder. He stayed because he loved her so much to say, I know, it's okay. But maybe your doubt doesn't come from pain. Not all of ours does. I want to look at Thomas now, someone that we all know, Doubting Thomas, the guy we all make fun of in our, our Sunday schools and our groups, that, oh, we're so much better than Thomas. We're not better than Thomas. I just want to start that off with that. We're not. Now, if you don't know, Thomas is the cliche dude of doubting. Basically, when all the people, all the disciples went back and they're like, Hey, Thomas, Jesus is alive. You're not going to believe it. Totally song. It's super awesome. Don't know how to explain it, but it's, it's there. Thomas is that guy that is on like those internet memes that goes, Fake! He doesn't believe it. He says, I don't see the evidence. I want to see it. And he says this for verbatim, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's gross. Why would you ever want, I'm not dumb, okay? I'm getting it, they're under a lot of emotional distress, but it's still weird. Well, maybe you're your doubt comes from trust issues. Maybe you don't trust that when God says he's going to do something in your life, he's actually going to do it. See, for Thomas, he had the same message from Jesus so many times before he died. He said, guys, I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. Well, he died, and they were waiting for him to come back, but Thomas, he didn't believe it. Is that how you are? in your life. When someone says, hey, I know you can't pay that tuition bill, but something's going to happen for you. It's going to work itself out. God wants you here. Are you doubting that? When you have a broken family and God says, I'm going to heal it, are you doubting that? A lot of our doubt comes from trust, just like Thomas's did. Because it's so easy for us to say, I don't have any evidence for it, so it can't be true. Even though God says it so many times, over and over, sends you a sign, sends you angels, he might as well have a giant billboard in I-490 saying, hey, it's going to work out. Which, by the way, that might actually happen. I don't know. If I get a lot of money, I might do that just for the, for the giggles. But let's see Jesus' response to a guy like Thomas, a guy like a lot of us. It says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Why were they locked? Because people were looking to persecute them. They were going to torture them. 
They were hiding. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. What did Thomas say to him? My Lord and my God. Again, really weird. Don't know why Jesus offered that, but he did. But the worst thing is that he actually did it. Even when Thomas was being a snot, a brat, saying there's no way that this could happen, Jesus came back and still provided proof that Thomas needed to believe. So maybe for some of us, we just need that proof. We just need that evidence. We just need that reassurance over and over and over again. But I'm here to tell you, that happens. There's, one of the, there's a good reason that patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Because there's no one more patient than God with you. And trust me, He needs it sometimes. With all of us, including myself. And I'm here to tell you that when you need a sign for your doubt, that things are going to work itself out, God provides that. The last person we're going to be looking at is Peter. And this is his famous conversation at the end of the book of John. In this story, Peter denies Jesus three times. Now I know, like, well, I mean, it kind of happens. Like, you kind of get pressured out of it and things happen. Sure, but this is the dude that Jesus named Rock. Like, he's supposed to be immovable. Petros. Why, why is he moving and shaking about? Why is he denying Jesus over and over again after he'd been killed? And so what I think caused Peter's doubt is fear. Have you ever just been so overwhelmed with fear that you can't do anything? Some of us are afraid of being tricked by this whole Christian lifestyle. Afraid that we're losing out on life. And in Peter's case, <laughs> he feared losing his life. And what was the reaction that Peter had because of this doubt that he had in his heart? Idleness. He hid and did nothing. He denied God so that he could get away and not be persecuted. I feel like there's a lot of Peters in this room. There's people that say, yeah, I came to Roberts because my family said that I should get a good Christian education. Some of us said that, hey, it was one of the few schools that gave me the best tuition, and now I'm stuck in this place called Chapel, and I don't know what I'm doing here. Please help. And you've sent many letters for help, but they haven't come yet. I'm going to tell you all that even though, even though you're all a lot like Peter, Jesus will still be with you. Because in this conversation, I'm going to show you what happened. So it goes to when Jesus comes back after this whole Thomas thing. And Peter is sitting with Jesus. I imagine by a nice cozy campfire. I imagine marshmallows. I know they didn't have them, but I'm just going to keep it there anyway. Um, feel free to keep that in your head. And this is the conversation they said. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and where, went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not need to go, do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death that Peter would have to glorify God. Now imagine this, you're like, well, Craig, you just lost me here. What does this mean? I'm saying that no matter what, even if you don't do your job in life, Peter's one job, he's the dude that you could say, Peter, you had one job. 
It was to start the church and be the rock for the church, but he couldn't even do that. Even when you fail at everything in your life, even when you don't do everything you were meant to live out to be, even when you fail that test, even when you aren't you, God is still with you. Even when you doubt it. And that's because the last character of God that I want to show you is that God blesses. God blesses. So let's look at our scenario right now. We've been told from our Christian lifestyle that it's bad to doubt God. It's bad for us to say that, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't really think this is going to happen. Then why did three of the disciples do it? And why didn't Jesus rebuke any of them? It's natural to doubt God. But what's not okay is to stop. You need to keep pushing through that doubt. Because even though you have something stuck in your ears, even though you have a blindfold on, even though you can't come in contact with our great God and what he's doing with each and every one of your lives, the amazing thing is, is that he's still there. Maybe he has angels around you, just like he had there for Mary Magdalene. Maybe he's waiting in the worst part of your life, trying to get you out of this doubt. Maybe you're a lot like Thomas, and you're just kind of stuck, and you say, God, there is no factual evidence, there is no way, I need more proof. And God says to you, I'm going to show you over and over again, through your friends, your family, through the things you learn, the things you see, I'm going to be there for you. Maybe you're a lot like Peter. Maybe you're afraid. You're afraid of what happens when you take that leap of faith. And God says, I'm there to catch you. So let's look at the three characteristics of God. God comforts, God provides, and God blesses. So no matter where you are in your life, I want you to hold on to these three characteristics of God because this is his nature. That when you're in your darkest moment, when you are at your worst, God is always going to be at his best. He is with you to comfort you when you are crying and weeping in your bed. He is with you when you have nothing. He'll provide. And he'll bless you until you are very old at the end of your days. So now I'm going to lead a prayer for us as we close. We're going to pray for our doubt. God, I don't know how you deal with any of us. We're the kids that shouldn't exist. We're the kids that don't deserve a father like you, but Lord, we love you so much. You're with us, and we, all we can say is thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. And God, as we doubt you, Help us to feel your presence. Help us to love you more and know you are here. God, thank you for every one of these people, and I pray for their circumstances, Lord, that they come to know you in a new way today. In your name I pray. Amen. Go with God's blessing.